Welcome back to In My Own Words with three-time world champ and Auburn Washington's Greg Haugen. You go to Vegas, you have to do a great start in your professional career. You win your first 19 fights. Tell us about the night you won your first IBF uh, light heavyweight championship. Lightweight. Lightweight championship. Um, well, I was a 4-1 to underdog. Uh, you know, and at the time it was Jimmy Paul, Hector Camacho, and Edwin Rosario were the three champions. And, and uh, Jimmy Paul had to fight, you know, when you're a champion, you only have to make a mandatory defense once a year, and that's the number one contender. And other than that, you can fight anybody in the top 12. And uh, they, they had just had a mandatory defense, and they wanted to fight in, uh, I believe it was December 5th of 86 at Caesars Palace, and they wanted to fight on that card. It was with Dwayne Thomas and John Mugabe. And Dwayne Thomas was one of his uh, uh, disabled mates because they were both from the Kronx gym in Detroit. And they happened to uh, want to fight, so they looked at the ratings and seen my name, didn't know who I was, and said, we'll take him. And, you know, and Emmanuel Stewart even came to my wedding after the fight. Two day, I got married two days later on the December 7th, and. Uh, he came to my wedding and uh, he told me uh, we didn't know who you were. You know, we would pick you, pick your name out of the out of the top twelve because we'd, we'd seen you fight one time. We thought you were right there in front of the guy to get hit, and we found out that wasn't the case. And you know, and uh, so you know, I, I think uh, I had went twelve rounds of fight before that to win the NABF belt, but you know, going fifteen rounds, there's a little doubt in your mind. That's an extra nine minutes. It's a long time. Those are the championship rounds, you know. And uh, I was a little leery. I mean, I was, wasn't sure I'd be able to go to 15 rounds. And at the time, he was the best champion of the three. And um, so I knew that I'd beat somebody good. Now, Greg, you have a, a, a good, a unique, and interesting nickname, the Mutt. <laughs> Who gave you the Mutt? And, 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 and when was that? And, and I guess you've liked it because you, you allow people well, to call you that, right? Uh, personal friends that know me by that. I mean, I, I, when I moved to Vegas, I didn't really take it with me. I didn't really want to be known as that. I, I figured I outgrew it, but my dad gave me that name because I was scrappy as a pit bull, I guess. Speaking of your parents, you know, I think the kids growing up playing sports, the parents are supportive and involved. They're driving the minivan, supplying, you know, the, the orange slices at halftime of the soccer, soccer games. But in boxing, you pick that. Was that difficult for your folks to, to get behind, or were they, did they support it? Like your mom support it from day one? You know, my mom didn't get to go to many of them, and if she did, it was just, you know. <laughs> That's you know, what she, I would imagine. Most of my buddies, they wouldn't sit, you know, when I start fighting pro up here, uh, most of my friends refused to sit next to my mother because by the time the fight was over, their ribs were black and blue. <laughs> she'd be able to, how's it going? You know, she wouldn't be looking at it, but she'd be elbowing them, asking them what's going on. So it got to be the point where all my buddies wouldn't sit next to her. <laughs> Sounds like you, know, you had a, a good relationship uh, w with your mother. If I, become a world champion, fighting for some, some big-time money. Was that kind of nice to be able to maybe thank her uh, and, and, and do something nice for her? Yeah, it was. Um, you know, I mean, uh, my mom basically raised six kids uh, by herself, worked hard. You know, she worked, uh, you know, she was a waitress and she worked odd jobs, but most of the time she food server and, uh, you know, I mean, I, having kids now, I, I, I respect her even more to know how hard it is to raise kids and, you know, being a single parent that she was, it was tough, so. So it all worked out and you fought yeah. some, some big time, some big time names, you know, who's who of boxing legends. I don't know if your mom saw them all because, you know, she's covering her eyes there, but you talk about Blue Moon Mancini, Hector Camacho, Sweet Pea, Julio Cesar Chavez. I mean, some great fighters. You had some great fights with them. Was there one that, that stands out in your mind as the best that you've ever faced? Uh, well, you know, well, the, you mean the best fighter I've faced? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, hands down, Pernell Whitaker. Hands down? Yeah, hands down. Skill wise, Hard to hit, southpaw, you know, goes down into a little crouch and just, is a, it's a nightmare, you know, because everything you've been taught as a fighter to jab, right hand, left hook, that's all out the window with southpaw. And jab doesn't really work on southpaw. It's got to be right hands, left hooks, and you got to keep your foot outside of his foot so you can control him, because if his foot's outside of yours, he's able to control you and move around you. 
puts your foot's outside of his and you're forcing him into your right hand. There's a lot more that goes into <laughs> a lot more that goes into fighting. And if you got a good southpaw, it's a nightmare. I mean, I never backed down from any of them. I fought most of them in their hometown because I had an idiot for a manager. Um, you know, take five or ten thousand or more dollars to fight in their hometown and. You know, I mean, I love going in hostile environments and shutting the crowd up to where they can't have nothing to cheer about because you're thumping their, their their hero. But, you know, every time, come on. It's nice to have a little hometown cooking now and then. So, you know, I mean, it got to the point where, uh, you know, I constantly was fighting in their towns and it got, you know, it wore on me. Talk about the, the ultimate hostile territory, I think. In Mexico City, fighting oh. Chavez, 130,000, the largest crowd ever to see a boxing match. You said recently that that you'd like to, to have that opportunity again, or if you did you'd do something different. What would you do different? Well, I'd have trained. I didn't train for that fight. I was going through a divorce and basically fighting with a broken heart. And you know, I mean, uh, you know, I've fought the toughest guys in the world, but I've never been brought to my knees like a woman can do it. And, I was just brought to my knees at that point, and uh, I, you know, I was heartbroken. And you know, and if you're not 110 percent mentally and physically when you're fighting a guy like Chavez, it's going to show. It's going to show right away. And it did. You know, I mean, they had to put me on a plane to get me to to go to Mexico City to train. I had to only start training the last few weeks. And, you know, and and that's probably my biggest regret right there, knowing that, uh, you know, knowing that I just there's nothing I can do about it now. But, uh, you know, that's one thing that really haunts me and bothers me. Uh, representing our country, and I'm a proud American. I fought in Copenhagen, Denmark, against the European champion and defended our flag very well, and I didn't do so well in Mexico City. So <laughs> and that was one of the things I could wish I could have back, but, you know, I can't, and I can't dwell on it. But, uh, you know, it definitely still bothers me a little bit. Thank <laughs> you.